us. My name is Natalie Walker. I'm the manager of college operations here at the Classic Learning Test. Um, for anyone unfamiliar with the CLT, we are a college entrance exam and assessment suite for grades seven through 12. One thing that distinguishes the CLT as a test is its content. Two thirds of the passages on any CLT exam come from our author bank, a list comprised of men and women who have contributed to the richness of philosophy and thought that we have inherited. These are authors you're likely to encounter in your college career, and hopefully you'll engage with them throughout your life. You can peruse that list on our website anytime. So most Thursdays of the academic year, a faculty member from one of our partner colleges helps us explore one author from the CLT Bank. Uh, this is what we call our Journey Through the Author Bank series. And you've joined us for a really special one tonight, I think. First of all, tonight's partner college is one of CLT's closest Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas is a Catholic liberal arts institution built on community, faith, and scholarship, and really excelling on all three of those fronts. The college offers um, 50 undergraduate programs, and Benedictine's president, Dr. Minnis, recently had a conversation with our CEO on our podcast, Anchored, and he made the observation that Benedictine might be the only college in the country where an engineering or business major is required to take ethics and kind of take seriously the philosophy and morality of their field. Um, the general education requirements at Benedictine are very strong and students even have the option to fulfill those requirements through the Great Books Program, which was named one of the 25 best Great Books programs in America by Best College Reviews. So from Homer to Dante, Plato, Dostoevsky, from Augustine to Sartre, the Great Books offers students the opportunity to encounter the great minds that shape the world we live in. I think Benedictine is one of the best, most unique opportunities available to students today to rigorously pursue a discipline, even and especially in STEM, um, receive a robust, robust liberal arts seminar driven education and deepen their faith in a genuine religious community, all in a fully integrated way. And that's not even half of what sets Benedictine apart. I'll put a link in the chat um, at the end of, of my introductions so you can read more about the ac academics at Benedictine. Um, tonight, I'm honored to introduce you to Dr. Edward Mulholland. He was born in the Bronx, New York, and received his master's degree in classics from the University of London, England, and received both a licentiate and a PhD in philosophy from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. Dr. Mulholland was the first director of NCE, formerly known as American Consultants for Education in 95. From 1996 to 98, he served as the head of the Humanities Department and the Dean of the Journalism School at the Centro Universitario Francisco de Vitoria in Madrid, Spain. From 1998 to 2005, he was Professor of Philosophy at Our Lady of Thornwood Education and Training Center in Thornwood, New York, and Professor of Classical Languages at the Center of Humanities in Cheshire, Connecticut. From 2005 to 11, he headed the Departments of Catholic Formation and Classical Languages at Pinecrest Academy in Atlanta, Georgia, he is currently in his 12th year in classical languages at Benedictine College, where he is the Sheridan Chair of Classics and co-directs the program of great books, The True, The Good, and The Beautiful. He spent the past five summers translating into English the first ever English translation of a Renaissance Latin epic poem on King David that has been lost for 400 years. He and his bride, Valerie, have six children and the world's cutest granddaughter, and one more on the way. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, before we hear from Dr. Mulholland, we do have two more special guests with us that you will meet very soon. Um, Anderson Waddle was a CLT 10 Regional Scholar this year. Congratulations on your CLT 10 performance. He has kindly introduced us to his friend and classmate, uh, Marin, and they both attend Paideia Classical School in Spring, Texas, where they recently read Boethius together, and they are going to lead our kind of question period following and, and have a conversation with Dr. Mulholland in the meantime. You all watching are also welcome to participate in the chat with your questions. Um, so we look really forward to hearing from you all. And thank you for joining us, Anderson and Marin. I know their teacher is one of the attendees tonight, I believe. So Jennifer, if you're watching, thank you for what you do in the conversations you're facilitating every week. The CLT loves Paideia Classical School and really appreciates you. Um, so Dr. Mulholland, I think that's all I have for now. Thank you again for being here. Would you? Take us well, thank you so time. much. Thanks for thanks for the invitation. Very very happy to be here uh, to discuss an author uh, uh, about whom uh, I, I wrote a doctoral mm -hmm. dissertation and uh, whom I, I I studied for years and who every summer when when here at Benedictine we have a 
um, a series of conferences called Benedictine um, College Youth Conference, BCYC. And there's a there's kind of a more um, kind of uh, church campy, I'd say, uh, conference that we have. And then we have one that's more academic. The one that's more academic is called Immersion. And um, it, with an immersion, you're able to pick different tracks to kind of test out what what college teaching what what, what it's what it's like. And I I uh, helped get that started about eight years ago. And um, I've done the great books track and the great book that we read because it is a book that you can do somewhat justice to in in in, in a week is the Consolation of Philosophy by uh, none other than uh, Boethius. So let's talk a little bit about uh, who Boethius was and uh, what he wrote and why he's important. And then we'll focus on, uh, touch on some of his works and especially end up with the book that uh, our students here have recently finished. And uh, that puts me at a disadvantage because they've read it more recently than I have. But and, uh, Boethius was called by Lorenzo Valla in the Renaissance, the last of the Romans, the first of the scholastics. So in a way, he's a, he's a, he's a figure of transition. And uh, we don't know exactly when he was born, they say around 480. But uh, if you wanna keep a date in your head, think 476, right? Because that is the date of the fall of the Roman empire in the West. And so with the, the deposing of Romulus Augustulus, who was only about, 10 or 12 years old at the time anyway, um, the, the Goths come in and, and take over uh, Italy as a kingdom. So Boethius is, is brought up in a time where the institutions of the Roman Empire have uh, still exist, but they've lost a lot of their influence. And he is from a family, his full name is uh, Anicius Manlius Severinus, or Tor, if you want to throw Torquatus in, you could do that too. Severinus Boethius. So um, his gens, right, his Roman Roman gens is uh, the Anicius family. And I remember uh, going to Monte Cassino and going to the tomb of St. Benedict, coming from Benedictine College, that was an obligatory uh, pilgrimage. And there in the mosaic, I, I was surprised to find uh, the inscription gens Aniciorum. So, so Benedict, St. Benedict as well, was from the same gens. He's also a contemporary of Boethius. Um, the, the author Luis de Wall, who does um, some novelized lives of the saints, um, has a book called Citadel of God, and it's about St. Benedict. And it, you'll find Boethius appearing in this book uh, almost, as, almost as often as St. Benedict. So he lives at this time where there's kind of a crossover of power and there is kind of a crashing of cultural waves. And one of the things that makes Boethius um, unique is that he had an education that was far advanced for his time. He, if I, I, I compare him to Cicero in a way, not only because of his Latin style, but also because when, 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 when Cicero's alive, we have the end of the Republic, right? And the end of the Republic, and Cicero gets to do study abroad with his friend that they later call Greek boy, because he went to study in Greece, they call him Atticus, and it's a nickname he has for the rest of his life. So Cicero has a facility with Greek that wasn't as common in, for Rome of his day. The same exists for Boethius. He has a facility with Greek, a, a absolute fluency with it, I would, I would argue, that it wasn't common for, for his time. His grandfather was a consul. His father was a consul. His father dies when he's relatively young and a very influential Roman senator by the name of Symmachus adopts him and brings him up in his household. And I guess Boethius impressed the old man because he is going to um, marry his daughter, uh, Rusticiana. And then he has two sons named Boethius and Symmachus. So there's just, it's just Boethius is all over the place or Boethii all over the places, all over the place you know, at, that, at that time. So after this education, he has kind of an intellectual project, right? He, he wants to translate into Latin everything that he can get his hands on of Plato and Aristotle and show that their thought isn't as diverse, 
isn't as, isn't as uh, in conflict as most people at the time thought. He believes that there's a great harmony between them if you interpret it correctly. And he also wants to show how it's, it's in general in harmony also with Christianity, right? So some of this had been done by uh, a, a convert just a hundred years before him uh, from the outskirts of the Roman Empire in North Africa, St. Augustine. So St. Augustine dies around 430 and Boethius is going to die in 524, so roughly 100 years apart. They are actually both buried in the same church in Pavia, Italy, so the, a church that's called St. Augustine at Celda, Celdoro, or uh, because it has uh, gold mosaics on the ceiling, so, so uh, sky of gold, right, or Celdauro, the older Italian, as it is mentioned in, in the Divine Comedy, where Boethius also makes an appearance. So he wants to do this, and it's a huge project, right? So he starts with Aristotle's works on logic, and he does a translation and a commentary on the categories. He does a translation and a double commentary on the perihermeneas in Greek, the De Interpretatione, which is where Aristotle talks about um, where you find truth, right? Because truth doesn't exist when you just say green or when you say tree, but when you say the tree is green and you actually make propositions. So he does that. He moves on to um, talk about uh, Aristotle's work on, on, on topical differences. He makes a commentary on Cicero's uh, work. He, he comments on Cicero's book on definitions. And so what does he get good at? He gets really good at making logical distinctions, right? But when he reads Plato, he finds out that a person who's a philosopher is supposed to, what? Get involved in the events of the day, right? Uh, the example in, in Plato's Republic, for example, when, when once, once somebody has been led out of the cave and gets to see reality as it is, there's kind of an obligation for that person to go back in the cave and 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 to enlighten those who are still living uh, in 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 darkness and living in the shadows and images of truth. So he gets involved in politics, and he is a, a senator. His father-in-law slash uh, mentor is uh, was a senator as well. And after um, Theodoric the Great comes and gets rid of. Uh, uh, Odoacar or Odovacar, as he's called, the, the one who had deposed Romulus Augustulus to establish this Gothic kingdom in Italy, um, Boethius starts climbing up the ranks and he becomes very, very influential. His, his own son, he, he's consul in 510, and his own sons are named honorary consuls, even though they're, they're quite young, in the year 522. And he gets to give, Boethius gets to give the, the, the opening speech in, in honor of the consular year, and it's kind of a, a high watermark for him, right? He is then named um, the master of offices, the magister officiorum or officiorum, and uh, which makes him think Thomas More to Henry VIII, right? It makes him kind of, kind of a Lord Chancellor type role. He's, he's the number two man in the kingdom. So, all of that's very, very good. What happens? Well, with any successful man, you're going to get some enemies. And what's going on here is that um, the Roman Empire in the East that still exists has a very strong leader at this time just coming in named Justin, em Emperor Justin I. And the um, Boethius and his family are Catholics. The Gothic kings, Theodoric, are Arians. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's 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 following a um, a particular interpretation of Christianity, which uh, which sees the the divine and the human in Jesus in, in in a slightly different way. So one of the things that Boethius does is he writes some very very small works on on theology, right? And and a lot of people will will call him a theologian for this. Um, actually, most people will. Um, I wouldn't, and that's 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 a little bit strange, but hear me out, right? We said that Boethius is really, really good at making logical distinctions, right? 
And if you read his theological works, other than the fourth one called uh, De Fide Christiana, which, which looks like notes that you would take while you were uh, learning your catechism, right? And he was instructed in the faith by this deacon John, who very possibly and probably was um, Pope John I. Um, all of his theological works are, are not constructing what we would call theological arguments, right? Looking at scripture and, and, and uh, tradition or what little tradition of the church existed at that time and, and trying to uh, draw forth conclusions. No, he's trying to say, I heard these people say this, you know, that, that, that Christ is in two natures or of two natures or, or, or uh, one person in two natures or two different persons, but nobody defined their terms, right? And he, 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 he talks about being at this meeting and there were some clerics there and he heard them uh, debating about this, this letter that had been written. And he said he couldn't, he, co he couldn't see the person that he wanted to see to see uh, what he was thinking about it. And he definitely means his, his father-in-law, Symmachus. But that these guys were just talking without defining their terms. And he said, he literally says this, that I didn't want to speak so that being the only sane one, I would be considered crazy among madmen, right? Not too many theologians speak that way about clerics. So the way I see him is as if, as if a carpenter were to come to uh, his, his parish priest and say, you know, Father, I'm really good at this, so do, do you need any woodwork done in the church, right? Boethius comes and says, you know, I think you need some help clarifying and defining your terms. And so in uh, a work on the Trinity and later on a work that is specifically against the heresies of um, Eutyches and Nestorius, which had recently been condemned in, the, in a century before him, a little bit less than a century before him uh, at, at the council of, um, of Chalcedon, and Ephesus before, he, he, he wants to define what, what do we mean by person. So one of the things that you'll see in, in Boethius is he's very, very famous for his this classical definition of a person as an individual substance of rational nature. A, a, uh, a definition that is later modified by St. Thomas Aquinas because you can't really um, talk of God as an individual. He's not an individual in the same that we are individuals and his nature uh, they, they 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 restrict the word rational later on to be to be of, of of beings who actually have a discursive intellect and not a completely intuitive intellect. And so they talk about an intellectual nature, and then and then our rational nature among intellectual natures is is kind of the the slowest, right? I was in a cathedral in England. I think it was in Durham, and they had this uh, window kind of one of these tic-tac-toe windows, nine panels, and it was, you know, seraphim and cherubim and thrones, powers, dominions, angels, archangels, and in the bottom right, looking looking a little bit out of place and looking strangely like Alfred E. Newman from Mad Magazine. There was just this, and it was just homo, man, right? Because remember, we we in 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 material creation we're kind of we kind of rule the roost right but in spiritual creation we we're the slow class right and uh and i think that 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 part of humility is important so that definition of person is later is later um pared down to a definition a subsistent in intellectual nature so that it can refer both to the persons of the trinity and to human persons but the definition of boethius of person is still still about the best that we have for um, persons, right? So what happens? He's he's doing this. He's 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 being asked to do things like make a water clock because some other um, Burgundian king was asking Theodoric for it. So Boethius is 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 a Renaissance man before there was a Renaissance, and it is largely thanks to him that the Latins of the West know the works of Aristotle, at least the works of logic, not the works of Aristotle that were lost and only discovered later, um, which kind of sparked this reinterest, this new interest in, in, in Aristotle, just in the generation before St. Thomas Aquinas, 
right? Thomas Aquinas himself writes a commentary on Boethius's work on the Trinity. And, it, it, you know, we kind of think everything in the past, it's kind of this, this, this big jumble. But if you, if you look at the years, it's roughly the same amount of time that separates Boethius and St. Thomas, more or less, that separates St. Thomas from us. Right, so 1500 years between us and St. Thomas and, and between us and Boethius and St. Thomas Aquinas is somewhat in the middle. I mean, those are those are huge spans of time. So what happens? Well, somebody writes a letter to uh, the Emperor Justin that Theoderic or is made to see as a threat. And it may have been that the Emperor Justin was putting pressure on Aryan churches under his realm, churches that had been Catholic churches, but were Aryan churches and he was trying to get them back. And Theoderic didn't like that and maybe had to do a little quid pro quo with, um, with the Catholics over there. But his number two man is, is Boethius. And so some of his advisors complain that this, this guy named Paulinus had written in support of something that Justin was doing, and they accuse him of treason. And Boethius stands up and says, it's not treason. I would have done the same thing. I support this guy. And I think he thought by doing that, you know, he was he was being completely honest. He was he was very upfront about where his um, leanings were. And even before the invention of Twitter, what happens? He gets canceled, right? He all of a sudden, everything comes down. He gets arrested. He gets taken. Um, he gets put in jail. He, get, he it's something that he's particularly angry about. If you, it's, it makes in no uncertain terms in book, books one and two of the consolation that he, the Senate condemns him in his absence. He's not even allowed to, to uh, defend himself. And he's put in jail for, we don't know exactly how long. Now here is where the real kind of literary miracle happens. And, and there's a lot of opinions whether he was under house arrest or, or what, what, what exactly his conditions were. But whatever they were, what comes out of it is one of the books that is on every single list until about 50 years ago of books that you would need to have read to be an educated person sometimes called On the Consolation of Philosophy, De Consolazione Philosophiae, but probably better, The Consolation of Philosophy, Consolatio Philosophiae. And it is a book that is written both in poetry and prose, right? The prose sections come first and then the poetry sections alternate. The poetry sections are written in a different, every single poem is in a different meter. So what are we to make of this? Well, we're probably to make that somebody gave this guy a pencil and paper, right? So at least something was there. We don't know how it was smuggled out. We don't know, we don't know how we got it. We don't know how long it took him to write it. We don't know if, it had, if, if he had any books that were available to him. If he didn't, the man is a genius beyond belief because he quotes and makes reference to almost every great Latin work before him right? So um, it, it really is the work of, the way I see it, uh, 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 a deeply passionate intellectual and a deeply passionate patriot of Rome who is trying to maintain his mental sanity, knowing that at some date in the future that he doesn't know, he's going to be executed. So he was either beheaded or some scholars say he had cords around his head and it was tightened and tightened and tightened until his eyes popped out then his skull was crushed you know th this this stuff that uh, of, of which legends are made right the stuff the stuff that uh, our founding fathers would call cruel and unusual punishment so he is uh, his remains are in that church in in, in pavia and this this work then came down to us through copyists and it has been extreme, extremely popular 
Uh, it's translated into so many different languages. It was translated by, uh, by King Alfred. Uh, it was translated by Elizabeth I, did certain Englishings of it. And it, it's just uh, kind of a marvel. So um, I wanted to ask, kind of open this up to discussion. What were your general impressions of, 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 of the book? And then to ask you what you thought it was about, and then I can share what I think it's about. I thought um, that it was structured really well. He makes his arguments in a linear fashion so that you can follow it and everything just, it's one after the other and it makes a lot of sense. And what I got from it was he was just trying to figure out how to be happy just at any point in your life, no matter where you are, if you have a lot of blessings or a lot of cursings, it's just how to be constant. Okay. Marin, about the same or? Yes, about the same. I think how to be happy and then what is happiness and what is goodness, like trying to answer that main question. Okay, because all because all these questions are very abstract, right? But the mm -hmm. question for him is extremely specific. I was here and now I'm here. How the heck did that happen? Right? And so in the in the opening poem. He he is he, he he is lamenting. It's 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 uh, it's written in elegiac couplets, which is the the uh, Roman meter for for lamentation, right? And what 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 he says in 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 the words of of my students and and, and my kids is, man, this is so random, right? Like what happened seems so random, and fortune has played me false, right? Fortune has not uh, has not been kind to me, right? And so, let me read. And the edition that I'm using is the uh, Ignatius Critical Edition, um, that's uh, edited and translated by Scott Goins and Barbara Wyman. Um, I like the Ignatius Critical Editions, especially um, when I'm dealing with um, high schoolers. Um, because not only are they really solid and and have and have good notes, um, but they also most of them contain some secondary scholarship at the end. Because if if you are um, writing a paper about the consolation of philosophy, it's not going to look like the consolation of philosophy. It's going to look like an article about the consolation of philosophy. And if you've never read an article about the consolation of philosophy, then maybe um, you should if you have to write a paper about one. But I found that if I just say, go do some research on your own, uh, in the state of academia today, uh, I will get people reading articles uh, about uh, how Boethius was gender confused or you know a, a bunch of other stuff that are just you know bizarre and um, reading things into the tradition that frankly, that frankly aren't there. So um, that's one of the reasons why I like using this book. So what happens while he's there? Right? Silent and alone. So this is the first prose. I was thinking about these things and began to record my tearful complaint when it seemed to me that a woman appeared standing over my head. She had a holy look and her eyes showed fire and pierced with a more than human penetration. One could hardly guess her age. Her face was vital and glowing, yet she seemed too full of years to belong to this generation. Her height was hard to tell. At one moment, it was that of any ordinary human, but at another, she seemed to strike the clouds with the crown of her head. Indeed, when she lifted her head higher, she could no longer be seen by mortal, by mortal eyes. So who is this? This is Lady Philosophy. Lady Philosophy who has come to comfort him. Lady Philosophy who has come to nur nurse him back to intellectual health, right? Lady Philosophy who was the one who educated him. And so we have this, 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 this beautiful image, this beautiful maternal image of, of the mind that is nourished by truth. And um, what it allows him to do within this, this genre, some call it Menippean satire of, of a prose and po uh, poetry mix, you, you, he's, he's allowed to have a very platonic Plato style dialogue where where the, the 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 commanding voice that would be the, the voice of socrates in the platonic dialogues will be lady philosophy 
and and Boethius will be the character who says, "Yep, uh huh, well, how do you do it, Socrates?" Um, but what happens here is you you can kind of track how Boethius is healing by how how much he starts getting involved and he and 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 there are moments in book three and in book four where he goes okay i see where you're going with this and he and he gives the conclusion showing that he is happy so so what what is the basic problem you you all mentioned it right the basic problem of happiness which normally occurs to us when we're not happy because happiness is only a problem when you don't have it right and this is the problem of the suffering just man Right, it's a classical problem. You you, you will see very often um, books that come from prison, right? Have this idea of how do I justify the suffering? Right? It could be in a in a very in a very godless way. My struggle, mein Kampf, that was written in prison, right? It could be um, I'm doing this because I'm uniting my sufferings to Christ. The letters of Saint Paul, many of them written in prison. It could be done in a, in a poetic union with the divine, uh, the ascent of Mount Carmel, still kind of a struggle, but um, that's uh, John of the Cross written in prison, church prison, church prison. That's, that's, that's tough to follow God when it was God's church who put you in prison, uh, illegally, as it turned out. But um, Boethius turns to philosophy. Now, one of the things that people find strange and people kind of write about and say, oh, Boethius must have lost his faith, right? He's not a Christian anymore because he doesn't write about theology. He writes about philosophy, right? We'll get back to that in a second. So fortune has deceived him, right? And philosophy basically says to him, she hasn't. Fortune is, as, as, as a... Uh, Presidential hopeful said uh, a few decades ago about the undecideds in an election. The undecideds can go either way, right? So fortune, if she is Miss Random, right? The fact that she acts seemingly randomly is actually true to her nature, right? Your problem is that you put all your eggs in her basket. So this she sees as Boethius forgetting who he is. He's forgotten who he is. And she asks him a question, says, are, are you a man? Yes, right? Uh, who made you? But what he's forgotten is what he's made for. He's forgotten that, that part of who he is, in Aristotle's language, is his final cause, right? So he says that, Yes, I, I I understand, and I I don't I don't understand why everything up there works perfect, right? Everything works by 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 clockwork, right? The sky, the heavens, the seasons, it all works perfectly, and yet the human world, it is it it's just it's just just randomness, right? Good people get treated bad, get treated badly. Bad people are CEOs of major con uh, at major corporations, right? You know why don't I win the lottery? I go to mass. Right, it's that kind of it's it's that it's that kind of thinking, and um, what philosophy has to do is tell him, you need to understand what the true goods are, and so books two and three of the Consolation are really a, 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 um, a compilation of the great arguments of antiquity, specifically the Gorgias, I believe, of of, of Plato, to say. What are the candidates for highest good that don't work, right? Honors, right? What other people say, prizes you can get, riches, even physical health, and ultimately pleasure as well. So what, what, what is the good that we can aspire to as human beings? And ultimately it's going to lead him to the conclusion right? That God is his highest good. And that God, God rules not only the um, physical laws of the universe, but the spiritual laws of, of our, our, our 
rational person world, right? And he does it through love. So we get this conclusion into book four about providence, right? And the conclusion is that it's not a question of fortune or providence. It is actually a subordination of fortune to providence, right? Because when we see everything from, from God's point of view, or the example I use, especially in the fall, is the X's and O's on the on the chalkboard, right? The play is as it's designed. It's going to work perfectly, right? But then we see it played out on the field that looks a little bit, it looks a little bit random, right? But it's actually all being controlled by God. And therefore the conclusion is there's no such thing as bad luck, right? Because you have four possibilities, right? Good things happen to good people. Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. Good to good, bad to bad, that's justice. No problem, right? Good things happen to bad people. Well, that is purification. And bad things and, and good things happen to bad people. That is giving them an opportunity to repent, we'd say, in, 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 in more Christian language, right? So we could wrap this up and end it right there at book four. But Boethius goes, eh, guess what? There's another problem. And the other problem is, you, you know what I'm, what is it, Marin? What's the other problem? Isn't it about free will and yeah. having predestination? Right. So if God's controlling everything and, 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 and God is provident, what happens? Do I have any free will at all? Mm -hmm. Right. God knows everything I'm going to do. Okay. So is freedom just an illusion? And you might say, okay, that's that's a separate problem, but it's a huge problem because if if freedom is an illusion, this guy's in jail, right, for something he did. So the entire criminal justice system shouldn't exist, right? Because if it's something I had to do and I wasn't responsible for it, then this is this this is all a sham. It's not making me feel much better in in in, in prison. I can't say I was unjustly condemned. Because there's no such thing as justice and injustice if everything is completely controlled. So philosophy says, first of all, props to you. You're definitely feeling better, right? Because you're, you're, you're coming up and, and seeing these questions, right? But Boethius says something even beyond the freedom question. And, and, and I think that it's important to understand where his mind is at when he's writing the Consolation. He says that it makes no sense to pray, right? Because if everything's automatic and it's going to happen no matter what I do because it's all predetermined, then what sense does it have to pray, right? So what does lady philosophy do? She says, I see your point. And I guess that it does look that way from our point of view, right? So if God knows what we're going to do, then we're going to have to do that, right? Now, this is something that Boethius had already taken a look at um, when he wrote, when he translated and did two commentaries on, on Aristotle's De Interpretatione, on the Perihermeneus, the second work within the Organon. Because one of those questions that, that Aristotle asks is, summarizing, is every declarative sentence true or false? And he wants to say, yes. And then here's a sentence, the Athenians will win the naval battle tomorrow. If that sentence is true, does it make that event a necessary event, right? So we normally talk about things that are necessary, things that are contingent, things that are possible, and things that are impossible, right? So things that are impossible cannot be. Things that are possible can be. Things that are contingent can not be. And things that are necessary cannot not be. You can put that in a nice little uh, square of opposition in, in, in logic. So. What are we to make of this? 
does God's knowing what we're going to do tomorrow make those events necessary? Okay. So what philosophy does is she says to him, let's see. I see that you're sitting down, right? I see that you're sitting down. Do you necessarily sit down? No, I don't necessarily sit down because standing up for me is actually a possible thing. I'm not, I'm not confined here. But if I say, Dr. Mulholland at 644, okay, central time was sitting down, that's a true statement. And guess what? It will be eternally true that I was sitting at this time, right? But does it make my sitting necessary? No, because my necessarily knowing the truth of that event doesn't change that that event is still a contingent event. It didn't have to happen. Great. How does that affect providence? Well, the second great classical definition that comes from Boethius is the definition of eternity. And his definition of eternity is um, inter binabilis vitae tota simulacque perfecta possessio the complete, simultaneous, and perfect possession of interminable life, right? Which isn't the greatest definition as definitions go, even by a guy who wrote a book about definitions, because you're trying to talk about something outside of time and you, you, you use words like interminable, right? Um, but what he's saying is that God is outside the chain of time. And since God is outside the chain of time, just, just like if I were to read Anna Karenina, right? And I'm outside, I can open at any page and pop myself right into Anna Karenina and those events are present to me, right? So everything that we do is present to God, right? And since everything that we do is present to God, God's knowledge to our choices is in the exact same situation as my knowledge that you are necessarily sitting, right? Even though you're not necessarily sitting, you understand, right? That it's necessary. It's true that you're sitting down because you're sitting down, but you don't necessarily sit. Well, that's true. I remember a friend of mine in high school said that because because I, I, I in 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 a particular moment of of, of intellectual productivity at, at lunchtime, we were talking about this, and he said, you know, it's known but it's not decided. And I read a lot about this. I read a long book called God's Foreknowledge and Future Contingents from Aristotle to Suarez, which goes over Boethius's take on this and Augustine's take on this and a whole bunch of people. I've never heard it summarized better than my buddy Chris Franz in the, in the senior section of the cafeteria at Regis High School saying it's known, but it's not decided. So, Listen to, at the end of book five, then, what she says to him. Since these things are so, this is the very end of it, freedom of the will remains unviolated for mortals, and the laws are not unfair when they propose rewards and punishments. So criminal justice system is, is legit. Since the will is free from all necessity, and God still remains a watchman on high, for knowing all things, and the ever-present eternity of his vision moves together with the future nature of our actions and dispenses rewards to the good and punishments to the bad. Could have ended it there, but she doesn't. Why? Because Boethius had another problem, remember? And not in vain are hopes and prayers placed before God, since when they are just, they cannot be without effect. So let us shun vices and cultivate virtues, lifting our minds to proper hopes and offering humble prayers on high. For if you wish, if you wish to speak the truth, a great necessity, pun intended, has been placed upon you men to do good since you live in front of a judge who sees all things. She drops the mic and that's the end. Maybe, maybe he saw the end was coming and had, had to finish it off. But for the people who say that he lost his faith, I think you have to understand that not only is in, 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 in the 
classification of the sciences in, in the Western tradition is, is philosophy on chile theologia, right? An ancillary discipline to theology. It's, it's, it's also that faith and reason work together for us. And so if, if, if I believe that all things are determined, that's not a great motivation to have any sort of a prayer life whatsoever, because it would seem that I have one conclusion from my reason, and, and my faith life is asking to, for me to do something that's completely incompatible with it, right? We need, we need to have a, a philosophy in consonance with the truth that can be a suffi sufficient underpinning of our life of faith. And I think that's what Boethius shows, not only through his life, but the, the very, very end of the consolation. So, so maybe his 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 thoughts on God and Scripture and his relationship with the Lord wasn't something he was really he was he was willing to put down on paper, but what he did put down on paper was the crisis not of faith that he had, but the crisis of faith that he had because he had a crisis of reason, and I think it's important uh, in 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 the world today that that we come to the defense as John Paul II did in in, in the encyclical Fides et Ratio, right? On faith and reason. Not only of faith, but also of reason, because both of them are at risk. And I think it's a it's um a layman, right? Not a cleric, like like Boethius, who was had a great, great books education, the great books of the time. There were fewer of them, so it was quicker to get. And um who who saw um, that he had they had a calling not only for the common good right but somebody who uses uh, philosophy in the in the in the service of not only the common good but but also also of his faith and who in my view dies a martyr for both. So, if you guys have any any questions, any any of your greatest hits that you wanted to hit, because I know I wasn't able to 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 cover it all, I'd I'd be more than more than happy to continue until yeah. he shut us down here. So um, I had a question. And it's, so was Boethius's philosophy um, inspired by his faith or did he take contemporary and classical philosophy and interpret it through the lens of Christianity? Like what order was that? I would think the second um, because I, I, I do believe he was brought up um, in, in, in a Christian household, but it, it would seem to be, especially if we're, we're, we are to take the, um, the fourth theological tractate as, as kind of his instruction, formal instruction in the faith, um, that it took some time for his intellectual understanding of his faith to catch up. Uh, but I, but, but I think that, that even from the beginning of his project, he has a um, he has this idea that that the conclusions that he's getting from Plato and Aristotle and his other reading um, are not going to be incompatible with his faith. And I and I think in that way he 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 parallels Augustine, right? Who has this has the training in rhetoric first, right, and then train. But Augustine having having a, a religious vocation. Uh, a, a teaching vocation and then a religious vocation and 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 Boethius doing so in politics. Either way, it's still faith seeking understanding and understanding seeking faith. That that kind of cycle works very very well. So he's he's first, you know, a translator of Aristotle. So the the first question I, I asked myself when I started. Um, studying him more deeply was what vision of philosophy does he have? Because anybody who translates some, something wants more people to read it, right? You don't have to. You don't have to become fluent in Greek. I'm I'm going to translate it for you. But what am I going to translate? I get to choose what I'm going to translate. So why these works, right? So what vision of and then um, what was what what became part of the thesis for the masters in London was what were some of the um, terms that he translated. We already have some of them that, that Cicero had done, right? Um, you know, quality, quantity, right? So the, 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 that word when Cicero said it sounded like what kind ofness and how muchness, right? And, 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 and now qualitas, quantitas, 
they they don't they don't sound that funny. But but when Aristotle did it, he just put a noun ending onto a question. What you know, like quiddity, quiddity, whatness. Um, Boethius has uh, words like intellectus and and ratio. We owe those 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 terms to um, to Boethius's translation of Aristotle. But the other question was how can how can we see this almost as a um, a motif of his philosophy? So what what does a person do? What does this individual substance of rational nature do? Right. So I've got a rational nature. It's open to everything. Aristotle says it's quodam modo omnia. Right. It's in a way all things. And yet I exist only now and in the here and now, right? So what, what a person, what a human person does is first, he translates particulars into universals through his intellect, right? See a lot of trees? Now I understand what a tree is, right? See a lot of dogs? I understand what a dog is, right? Sometimes you don't need a lot. Sometimes you take it on someone's faith. Sometimes you read it in a book, but you have these different concepts and these concepts are universal. They, they work for every individual under that, under that um, species. But then what do I do when I do good? What do, what do I do when I perform um, works of virtue, right? When I choose goodness with my will and I bring that through my actions, what am I doing? I am translating universals into particulars, right? I am instantiating charity and, 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 and temperance and justice, right? Into, into the here and now. I'm taking my understanding of what this universal is and I'm bringing it into the world action by action. And I think that that's a particular privilege of of this 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 strange being that we are this citizen of two worlds that we are right even though we are in the slow class in spiritual creation we're still you know doing pretty pretty well for material creation and it is it is that particular in betweenness what 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 plato called a metaxi right the greek word for kind of being in between that um, Boethius himself in his life, being an in-between figure between the Romans and the scholastics, right? Being a link between the Western empire and the Eastern empire, between the Latin world and the Greek world. And, and, and also being um, a link between um, the great politicians and, 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 and laymen who have been philosophers and the great clerics that have been uh, philosophers and, and, and theologians later. So, it's definitely uh, a work that deserves your attention. And the culmination of, of the week when we do it in, in BCYC immersion is um, I have the summary of the consolation uh, sung to an Ed Sheeran song. It, 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 it summarizes the entire thing uh, in an Ed Sheeran song, but you have to come for the week. You have to come for the summer for that. I don't want Ed Sheeran shutting us down now for violation of copyright. And it's called thinking it through instead of instead of thinking out loud. That's awesome. Can I ask a question? Sure, please. So have you do you believe that Boethius's ideals from the consolation of philosophy have pressed an impact on modern Christianity? Are we seeing any of that? Um, it depends what you mean by modern Christianity. Right, because there's there's a way in which modern Christianity means no longer Christianity, right? Um, but I like to talk about uh, philosophia perennis, right? So the perennial philosophy, this these these great conclusions that have that that, that have lasted, right? Um, there's a, a Spanish philosopher named uh, Julian Marias, and he has an essay that's called "The Fragility of Evidence," right? So when we say we hold these truths to be self-evident, all men are created equal, right? It's self-evident to us. It took centuries for us to see that clearly, right? And if we don't continue the effort of thinking through with these great thinkers, mm -hmm. things become less evident, right? It, become, it, 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 it is not evident to a lot of people that a child in the womb is a human being, strangely enough right? We can lose it. 
so what I see, what I see of, of Boethius's kind of lasting legacy is, is that the, those ideals that you have to think things through, right? And that there's moments in your life where you can have a crisis, not only of your faith, but also of your reason, right? But if you, if you kind of hold your, 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 your nose to the grinds, to the intellectual grindstone, right? That you can, you can think these through. When I was in, when I was in Spain, and uh, we were kind of putting together what what the curriculum of the university that I was helping to start was. We 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 were we were adding kind of a parallel curriculum to these uh, government mandated programs that they had there, and we were saying, okay, uh, we want them to have you know kind of a humanities subject every semester for their eight semesters. And the question was, more philosophy or more theology, right? How how do you do it? Uh, and the conclusion that we reached was more philosophy. The reason was because if you have those ideas thought through once, you can think yourself back there again. If you lose your faith and you have no intellectual undergirding of it, you have no way to you have no way to get back there. You have no you have you have not built any scaffolding kind of kind of to help you. You, you. There's no there's no philosophical rebar in your in your theological concrete, so to speak, right? If it, if it crushes, you're going to have no framework. But if you have something that happens to you, like that happens to Boethius, right? You're able to bring that back because you, 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 you've seen those, those, um, in, those rational conclusions in, in, in the light of day. And, and as long as you have enough time to think it through, and 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 you cast aside the the emotional pity party of 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 the harlots of the stage, which is what what philosophy herself calls calls those uh, those uh, thoughts and emotions. Then then you are going to be able to get to the point where you say, you know what, prayer is meaningful, and 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 faith is a it's a different kind of knowledge, but it's a justified type of knowledge. It's very interesting. So I guess I'll ask another question. Sure. So do you think that today's world is ruled by fickle fortune? And do you think that's because of a lack of understanding of Boethius? Like it hasn't touched everyone? R ruled by fickle fortune in what sense like 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 people's lives are ruled by fickle fortune yeah like we're very subject to yeah, that's always been true right mm. it's 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 always been true you 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 you, you go to st peter's right and you're in bernini's colonnade and you look at it and it looks like random yeah. columns, right mm -hmm. there's two places in the square i don't know what we call it a square it's not a square there's two places in the square that it's actually marked and it says centro dell'ellisse center of the ellipse and i was like do you mean the focus of the ellipse <laughs> and when you stand there and you look all the columns are perfectly aligned right <laughs> what happens is if if we are not in what uh t.s Eliot would call the still point of a turning world right then where are we going to be? Have you ever been on that carnival ride where you go in and it, it, it's basically a human uh, centrifuge, right? And all of a sudden, then the floor drops out, right? It's it's not a good. It's not a. I mean, you don't want to be on that more than once, right? A night because you're going to get sick. Well, that's what happens, right? The farther we are from the center, the more and more we are going to be subject to. Here's here's here's. Uh, an immediate uh, contribution of Boethius to modern culture, the wheel of fortune, mm -hmm. right? We are going to be at the end of the wheel of fortune and we're just going to be dizzy, right? But what, what philosophy does to Boethius, he, he puts him back in the middle and he's able to see that there is sense and meaning in all these different events that, that are happening. The ones that are positive from a certain point of view, the ones that are negative from a certain point of view. And to know that no matter what, God intends to bring out good for him personally, not just for the world, for him personally from those events. 
any person that's in that's in that type of intellectual vigor and health, right, transcends modernity or 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 the ancient world because he is he or she is at the still point of a turning world. So yeah, I mean, I I think I think there is um, the real pandemic in our in our, in our lives as it always is is unnecessary unhappiness. There's plenty of things that we can be necessarily unhappy about, right? Our own sinfulness, the, 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 how, how, how fallen nature takes a very, very particular form in us, right? But this other thing that I'm not, you know, that I can't slam dunk a basketball or I don't, you know, I'm not as cute as, 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 as my classmate or I can't, you know, write and publish books like like the guy in the next room or whatever, whatever, the, whatever these things are that I didn't win the, the, the Powerball, they're not really reasons for us to be unhappy, right? They're just they're just things that 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 that, that slow us down. They're things that 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 just get into our heads, and and lead us. Not even to start the consolation, we're just in elegiac elid, pity party lamentation. We're never beyond the first poem of the consolation, and 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 that's unfortunate because you can't build a meaningful human life on the basis of that. So do you think that um, Boethius had this idea of God is the only true source of happiness throughout his life, and then he only briefly lost it once you know he was imprisoned and he had a, you know, a disruption? So do you think his philosophy was constant, and then he just wrote it down at the end, or do you think it shifted once he got a new perspective? I I, I think he must have had it from the beginning, right? Because in it, even in the um, theological tractates. He, he, he says that God God is substantial goodness right God God is God is goodness with a capital G and and even though he's, he he says it it sounds like it, it sounds very dry and 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 and, and metaphysical um, it must have meant something to him right and here's the thing he had to have thought this through before he started writing it down. Right, because I don't think he wrote the first poem because because the, 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 he starts down a road right in the first prose section of book one with philosophy's appearance. So maybe he didn't have the entire thing done, but he had to have the general outline of it done. So I I, I think that um, he he had this thought and and it was a consoling thought and he knew that it was a philosophical thought and for him writing it down. First of all, it passed the time, right? And it 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 kept him from despairing. They say they say that um, the description he has of 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 philosophy's dress that she has a, a theta and a pi on it, and then there's this some sort of a stairway between them, right? The original stairway to heaven. He talks about uh, that 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 it it stands for. Theoria and praxis, right? So theoretical philosophy and practical philosophy. Um, that an article that I read when I was doing the um, dissertation said that it possibly came from the fact that uh, prisoners, at least in the in in the East, and maybe it was a custom also in 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 the Latin West, that they had on their gowns, on their prison gowns, a theta that stood for thanatos, death, right? That that that, that they knew that they were. They were marked, marked for death. So um, it, it, it's interesting that there's another tradition of, of, of spiritual writing that you know I wouldn't necessarily ascribe to the consolation, but it's not too far off. Is a memento mori, right? But it's this this idea that know that someday you're you're going to perish cannot be a thought very far away from a death row inmate, right? Which he most certainly was at the time. So who would you say were his biggest uh, phil philosophical inspirations? Like what was his, the school of thought that he aligned with the most? Well, at the time there was a, there was kind of a um, neoplatonic, what they call it a neoplatonic synthesis. So you've, you've got, you've, you've got these uh, philosophers that came um, in, in, in late antiquity 
um, uh, Porphyry and Proclus and, and Iamblichus and, uh, and thinkers like that. But for him, it's Plato and Aristotle. I mean, he says he wants, to, I mean, he, in, in the introduction to one of the commentaries on Perihimeneus, he says, this was my plan. I'm sitting here and this, this, is, what, this is what I want to do. So it's, it's definitely Plato and Aristotle. Now, I don't know exactly how many works of Aristotle he would have, he would have been able to have his hands on because we know that some of them were, some of them were lost and then went in through Syria, right? And then uh, we did rediscover them in the West um, later on in the in 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 the thirteen fourteen excuse me in the uh, in the eleven and twelve hundreds, and um, through the school of translators of Toledo and 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 William of Merbeke and and with that. So I mean, Cicero spoke Greek. Saint Augustine, no. Right, Saint Thomas Aquinas, some but couldn't read it in the original. He he relies on translations. Uh, Boethius is special in the fact that he that, that he has a command of uh, of of both languages. I mean, you have to to be able to translate. I mean, for me, I, let me ask you a question: what 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 was the biggest lesson that you had as a takeaway? I mean, does Boethius have anything to say to a high school student in 2022? I think I definitely uh, took the most, like the biggest lesson from the fickle fortune and like, don't be happy. Don't feel true happiness from something that isn't really real. Like if it doesn't come from God, it, it isn't real. And don't get to um, find too much pleasure because it, you get let down with materialistic. Are you familiar with the musical Guys and Dolls? I'm not. Okay, so it's a great musical, but it has a song that you may have heard Sinatra's version of it, Luck Be a Lady Tonight, right? They call mm -hmm. you Lady Luck, but there could be some doubt. Sometimes you have a very unladylike way of running out, he says, right? But that's, she's not a lady. That's the whole point. Philosophy is the lady. Mm-hmm. Because because Lady Luck, now you're up, now you're down. If it's random, it's random. That's the whole point that philosophy makes at the beginning of the constellation. That fortune, fickle fortune. Is there any other kind? Yeah, I guess. Right. Not. So if 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 it's if 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 it's not, then 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 you've uh, loaded the dice, my friend. Right. If 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 you're flipping coins and it's coming up heads a hundred times in a row, uh, that's a two-headed coin. Or that's you know one heck of a TikTok video because uh, there's it, it's it's something that's almost never going to, almost never going to happen. The odds against that are astronomical. So um, there there's this idea that that um, what really is going to nourish your soul are not the goods that fortune can bring you, right? I I, I also think that um, it it might not be a direct line from the consolation but there's this idea that what we should be aiming for isn't necessarily happiness happiness is a byproduct of cultivating the goods that are proper to our nature right so a, a flower is happy metaphorically speaking when when it's good at being a flower right when the goods of a flower when it has good color and all these things and a human being is happy when 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 he flourishes in those human goods, right? It's it's kind of uh, the meaning of Saint Irenaeus saying that the glory of God is man is man alive. It's, it's, they say man fully alive, but he doesn't say it. he just says vivens, right? He just says it's man living, because until you are fully alive, then you're not. It's not vivens, right? There's there's some part of you that's that's not alive, and if you are entrusting your happiness to goods that are below your nature, then, right at the at the end of the of, of the republic, you're going to be the type of person who picks for the next life to be a monkey, right? You're the person who picks for the next life to be uh, a goat, right? Not the goat. I remember I, I remember hearing somebody saying that the goat. And even even the, the abbot here said it in a sermon. He says it was strange that they were saying this in a positive way. 
when the tradition, you know, <laughs> GOAT is always bad in the tradition. And that's this acronym for greatest of all time. But um, what I'm trying to say is if you pursue the goods that are that 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 make you who you are, truly make you who you are, um, then what you should be seeking is fulfillment. Right. And 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 fulfillment brings happiness with it in its wake. Right. There's a, a movie when I was your age in high school that came out called Chariots of Fire. Great movie about the 1924 Olympics. And there's a scene in that where Eric Little, who's a uh, Scottish missionary born in China and went to the University of Edinburgh, well, St. Andrews University in Edinburgh. That's where, that's where Kate found her prince. And um, he's really, really fast. He starts playing rugby. He's really fast. They say, we got to get this guy running on the track team. And his sister didn't understand why his dedication to athletics was taking away from his time doing missionary work. And when he's training for the Olympics, he goes and says to her, he asks her if she would take over the mission for him until he's finished with the Olympics. And, and um, she very kindly says yes in kind of that silent sister way. She gives him a kiss on the cheek and you're like, was that a yes or a no? But he says to her, I believe that God made me for a purpose for China, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. He doesn't say I'm happy, right? But how could you not be? I feel the fulfillment, right? So if we go back to that idea of God's plan versus our execution of that plan, right? The X's and O's, the play that's drawn up by the coach, and then we have to execute it. Well, that plan is going to work because God is omniscient, right? And his plans are unfailing, right? But sometimes the failure is us when we don't execute. But if we do execute and we win the championship, then, then we feel the pleasure of the coach through us, right? I'm so happy for these guys. You've seen every, every you know, Super Bowl, every, every um, college bowl championship. You'll see, I'm so happy for these guys. They did it. And, the, and they'll say, no, it was the coach. He did this. But it is, it is kind of a, a, an, inter, an intersection of chains of causality, that both, an image that both Aristotle and Boethius use, right? So Boethius really, I, I think he shows it clearly. And, 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 and in a way, it, and it's a, a book that, that um, even, even, even at your age, and I'm not trying to give it low, but I mean, relatively not a lot of life experience yet, but you get it, right? It's a book that, that a high schooler can pick up and, 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 and read and read with profit. And not only that, identify with it, right? Because it has every great philosophical problem uh, of the Middle Ages, the problem of universals, the problem of goodness, the problem of evil, the problem of justice, the problem of providence, the problem of future contingents, the problem of freedom. They're all, they're all there. Um, and yet um, they're resolved, not in any abstract way, they're resolved for a very particular problem of a very particular person. And that person is Boethius. I can definitely say that after reading it, I've been able to detect the things that bring like true um, satisfaction. And those are the things that are, uh, that God made for us, you know, other people and um, nature even at times, but knowing that um, God is always there is like just always comforting. So I think that was kind of the biggest takeaway of knowing where my happiness should be. It's the things that, you know, God gives me. So that but it's but it's not some some unfeeling judge, right? Because he says, you know, you have a judge who sees all things. But he says, she says to him, therefore, right, you have a great incentive to practice virtue and shun vice, right? And 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 yeah, okay, I better not steal the cookie from the cookie jar because you know there may be a security camera. The the other thing is because you have somebody who's ready to reward you, but the reward is not is 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 not something later. Right. The reward is you have been who you're supposed to be in that moment. I, I don't know. I have written in maybe hundreds by now of high school yearbooks. The real you is Saint you. Right. 
because that's you that's who you are that's your your identity that's what you were created to be right and whether he's celebrated on the on the liturgical calendar outside the diocese of pavia as san severino uh boethius achieved holiness right but he achieved it as a layman he achieved it not not as a not as a uh not as a cleric who spent you know eight hours a day in 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 prayer as a man of, as a man of the world and as a man in the world and 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 if that's what we're called to be we're all we're all called to holiness that's our vocation right but we're also we also have an avocation right how we are going to live out this particular call to holiness right and i do so with this woman right here right i i do so first and foremost in my in my um, sacramental, I live out the sacrament of my baptism in my sacramental calling, in um, as husband and father, right? And then in and then in my profession, right? So so Boethius for me gives gives me example gives gives me example of that, right? As somebody as 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 someone who works in the world, as somebody who you 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 can really sense his worry for his kids and his wife. Um, that that he, he he speaks about early on in the consolation too, and um, I believe his kids were put to death. His, his father-in-law was, and and I think I think his his wife may have been. She's kind of kind of lost to to history. So I mean, to know that 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 speaking up and doing the right thing is 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 maybe even going to have consequences for for those that you love the most. I mean, that's that's rough stuff. Natalie, I don't know how how long this is supposed to take, but we're you know. Yeah, I think we're I think we're right at that we're moving point. Moving on. Yeah, um, just to to close us, I was going to ask you. This is really just for more of the same, but um, maybe do you have Dr. Mulholland any any advice kind of towards this uh, about human flourishing? It can be as close to Boethius as you like, um, but specifically for our students kind of as students, maybe as readers, or as they start thinking about colleges and next steps after school and making decisions like that. Um, yeah, do you have any more kind of specific or practical advice? Well, I would, I would say, think with eternity in mind, right? So it's not, what's, what's the school that this girl that I've dated for four months happens to be going to, and therefore I'm gonna make this life decision based on that. Or this is what I think I'm going to study and I'm going to lock in my life choice at age 18, right? You got to, you got to keep an open mind. Where's the place where you are going to have an environment to be the person that you know God created you to be, right? Because I know somebody says, well, at this school, it's not that bad. And, you know, I, I don't think I'll lose my faith, right? Well, how about where the faith is going to find you, right? And the faith is going to call you to be um, greater and where your development in the faith and your development in 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 your profession and in your other um, liberal arts tradition will be will be on the same level. But I also say, going back to that, when I run, I feel his pleasure. Quote: What 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 makes you feel fulfilled? Right? God is not going to ask you to do something that you hate. He's not going to ask you to do something that you feel you feel awful doing. Right? Because when I get freshmen, oh, I have no idea what I'm going to major in. I go, chemical engineering. And they go, no. And I'm like, well, you have some idea, <laughs> right? So a lot of times it's kind of narrowing it down. When people say they have no idea, it normally means I have two, three, or four possibilities, not 72. And um, be patient, right? Because, because being good at several things is not a problem right it's actually it's actually a very positive thing and 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 god might reveal his his ways right i had i i started studying for the priesthood and then and 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 discerned out and so a lot of my philosophy was through that and my first love was classics and it pulled me away from it and then i kind of got got back into that so it's a um it's 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 a life where as long as you're open and and it's it's a question of trust right because i i i know that god wants what's best for me i mean that's the ultimate lesson of the consolation of philosophy 
that what I'm going through now, somehow, not only is, is good going to come from it later, right? But that this is the absolute best thing for me right now, because I'm not conscious of the fact that I'm sinning right now and choosing this, right? So God is certainly allowing this, allowing this to happen, right? And I know, I know seniors in high school, right? I taught seniors in high school forever. It's one of my favorite groups of people on the planet, right? It's this thing that everything in American culture tells you, oh, it's the greatest year of your life. The greatest year of your life is 18. What do you have to look forward to? But it's also a year of a lot of insecurity because everybody else in your high school knows where they're going to school next year. And most of you don't, right? And so it's also this sense that this thing, this community that we built for X number of years uh, is going to be different, right? People are going to be going to different places and you, you, you want to take advantage of that. So I would say, keep an open mind. I would also say visit Benedictine College because we've got a really good thing going on here. Um, and I think it's the type of environment where students like you can really, really excel, whether whether it is, is strictly in the humanities or in one of one of the, the other professional fields, like you had mentioned, you know, engineering and architecture and and nursing, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of my advice. I also say two things in college. Frequent confession. These are two habits. You can Google it. I wrote an article called The Two Habits of Successful Catholic Students. Frequent confession and study when the sun is out. Because the other thing is right now, you you study a lot of extracurriculars. You know, if you're playing a sport, you're not getting home until it's after dark, eating a quick dinner, doing some homework, whatever. In college, all of a sudden you have these blocks during the day. And somebody's going to say, hey, let's go play Halo 7 by then. I don't know what number we're up to. And, and uh, if you don't block those times, then you're not going to have this consciousness that my nine to five job is to be a student. And sometimes that's going to be a nine to 11 PM job when exams and papers and things like that. But if you, if you structure that time well and use that time well and don't waste it during the day, then you, you are going to free yourself up for, to go to a guest lecture or a museum visit, or just, just go to a party or just get some coffee and, and talk these things out because some of the greatest moments of college are the moments outside the classroom. Some of the best conversations even I've had with my students have been outside, outside the classroom in, in, in uh, the coffee shop on campus or, or at some other event. So that would be my advice. That's great advice. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Anderson and Marin for, for joining us for your time and attention. Really a thank pleasure you. to meet you. And thank you again, Dr. Mulholland. All right. God bless.